Well, good morning. I'm Pastor Chris. Welcome to Glory Baptist Church, Church Online. So glad you could join us this morning. We are going to be in the book of John. If you have a Bible there, open up to John 18. You could pull up on a little side screen. You version will be in John 18. Uh, you could pull it up on your phone or just grab your good old regular paper Bible and you can follow along. Um, I'm going to be reading a big chunk of John 18, verses 1 through 27, to set up the story today. And it's a, a pretty amazing passage, and it really, really sets home for us our, our journey as we work our way towards Easter. Today, as we walk with Jesus, as he makes his trek to the cross and to his crucifixion, his betrayal comes to the surface now, and everyone becomes aware of just what exactly it is that Judas has done. So let's read together. It's going to be John 18, 1 through 27. I'm using the ESV, but follow along with whatever version of the Bible you have there. There it says, when Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the brook Kidron, where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and they fell to the ground. So he asked them again, Whom do you seek? And again they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. Of those whom you gave me, I have not lost one. Then Simon Peter, having drawn a sword, struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, Put away your sword, put it into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that my father has given me? So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. First, they led him to Ananias, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood outside of the door. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and then brought Peter in. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, You also are not one of these man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the servant and the officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter was also with them, standing and warming himself. The high priest then answered, or the high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said these things, one of the officers standing there struck Jesus with his hand, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If what I said is wrong... Bear witness about what is wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? Ananias then sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Verse 25. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. So they said to him, You also are not one of his disciples, are you? And he denied it. And he said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man, of whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? 
Peter again denied it, and at once the rooster crowed. John's gospel, John's gospel emphasizes things from a little bit different perspective than do Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the other gospels. The rule of Judas, for example, is played down a little in the interest of another truth, that Jesus is in full control. Indeed, even the way that the story kind of weaves its way, first of all, to Ananias, the father-in-law to Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year, it's still the control. It, it, it's still the, the sovereignty of Jesus that John wants to emphasize here. So I want to take three elements out of this story, and I want us to see from those uh, three elements the, the way that, that John, the gospel writer, is, is portraying Jesus to us. And he's answering the questions of who is Jesus? Why did he come? And to what end did Jesus come into the world? What, what is the significance of this story to me? And I want us to, to pick out of those three statements uh, to be able to see in those different sections that hopefully will help enable us to understand what it is that John is saying here. And the first part is that simple question. Who is Jesus? First, look at verse 11. The words of Jesus there, he says, Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given to me? Says Jesus. See, Judas had, had left some time ago. We read about that at the close of, of, of John chapter 13 when Jesus had washed the disciples' feet, right? He'd, he'd taken off his outer garment and, and he wraps a towel around himself and he gets down and he humbles himself and he, and he washes these men's feet. And then it's after that, shortly later, that Judas leaves. And then he, he begins those eloquent uh, chapters in 14, 15, and 16. And, and then we get to the, the high priestly prayer that we got in in, in chapter 17, we, we heard about that last Sunday, in fact. And now Judas is gone, and he's left, and he's off to, to betray Jesus to the authorities. And, and, and it's a, a, a time of a, a sinister coming together, a collusion of, uh, of the state and the church, of, of soldiers and officials of the high priest and the Pharisees. And, and we see that in, in today's reading in verse 3, that they, they come to Jesus armed to the teeth to arrest him, right? They, they, come with, they come with swords, they come with clubs, they come with daggers to arrest Jesus, who, who never so much as, as lifted a finger against anyone. The only occasion in all of the stories we have in the Gospels where he had even come close to anything was, was, was the time where he, he, he flips some tables in the temple and, and chases some people out with the whips. But we see in the story they're intimidated by him. Interesting, isn't it? You see, the world is intimidated by Jesus. The world is intimidated by his holiness. Soldiers had come. In other words, uh, a band of soldiers, right? There's some ambiguity there, but suffice it to say, there's a bunch of soldiers that have come. And they've got lanterns, and, and they've got torches, and, and they've got swords, and daggers, and clubs, and whatever else, right? And they've, they've come for Jesus. And while John's recount of the gospel here doesn't include it, the likelihood is that Judas' kiss probably takes place at the end of verse 5, when John records that, that Judas was there standing with the soldiers. But what John wants us to see is that nothing lies outside of the jurisdiction of Jesus. There's no evidence here of even the, the struggle that the other gospel writers record in the Garden of Gethsemane. Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. 
Now, John, of course, knew that had occurred. John was there, right? John had heard that. John knows that segment is in the other Gospels. But John has a different focus. John wants us to see that despite all of what is going on, that Jesus is in full control. Nothing takes him by surprise. Not his arrest, not Judas's betrayal, not Peter's denial, but everything works out according to the determinate counsel and the foreknowledge of God. It's his plan. It's his will. He knows what's going on. You notice how John wants to emphasize that point? When the mob says that they're looking for Jesus, Jesus, the Nazarene, Jesus says in verse 5, and in the Greek, the response is just simply the words, I am. And that seems to me to be deeply significant. That, that's not just simply, hey, I'm the guy that you're looking for. But instead, Jesus' response is, I am the God you were looking for. See, several times in, in John's Gospel, John has pointed out the, 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 the different ways in which Jesus has personally identified himself and declared his identity with these words, the words, I am. I am that I am. The Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. And notice, notice how John records the response to Jesus when he says, I am, right? What did the people, what did the men do? The men with the swords, the men with the daggers and the clubs and the lanterns, what do they do? They fall backwards. They fall to the ground. As if they had come close to some kind of divine revelation that had thrown them off physically and thrown them off of their guard. Do you see what John is saying as he describes this incident? In the, the most vulnerable place in the earthly life and ministry of Jesus, perhaps maybe only the temptation in the wilderness comes close to this, here in the Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus is arrested by soldiers with, with swords and with clubs, John is saying, do you see? This is God. This is God. Jesus is God. This is the Lord of glory here. This is the divine I am here. This is God incarnate. Nothing takes him by surprise. There seems to be an allusion here to some of the words from Psalm 27. When evil men advance against me to devour my flesh, when my enemies and my foes attack me, they will stumble and they will fall. It's at this point in the narrative that Peter kind of, he pulls out his sword, right? She cuts off the right ear of the servant of the high priest, a man by the name of Malchus. What is Peter doing with a sword? I mean, he's come from the upper room and he's been listening to these wonderful words of Jesus. He's, he's heard the, the high priestly prayer, perhaps, and they, they'd gone across the Kidron Valley to the Garden of Gethsemane on the slopes of the Mount Olives. What was he doing with a sword? And Jesus immediately tells him. Now, John doesn't record Jesus' healing of this man's ear, but Jesus tells him, Put away your sword. You see, there's a place for the sword in this world. But this isn't it. The church isn't born and doesn't grow and doesn't flourish with a sword. The weapons of our warfare are not of this earth, but are spiritual. Mighty through God to the pulling down of the strongholds of this land. And then he says in verse 11, put it away, Peter. And he uses this occasion to say to Peter, effectively, Peter, I understand your desire. I understand your impulse to defend me. 
We don't know exactly why Peter reacted this way. I mean, maybe it was just simply Peter's at first, think second nature. But what we do see is that Jesus takes this opportunity as Jesus always does. And in, and in this most vulnerable of positions, he makes it a lesson. Even in this moment, he's teaching, he's leading. And he says, the cup which the Father has given me, shall I not drink it? And he's taking an Old Testament metaphor for, for many places, but particularly uh, Isaiah 51 especially. The cup was symbolic of the wrath of God. The cup which he is about to drink to its very last dregs. The cup which the other Gospels records for us. The cup that he struggles with. And he says, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. But in John's Gospel, John wants us to see another angle. He wants us to see that, that Jesus took that cup and that he resolved to take his servant ministry to the very, very end. And he would take the unmitigated wrath of God against sin. Not his sin, but our sin. He would go to the, the very end and not shy away. It's a cup that his father had given to him. Remember that in the blessing that we receive through Christ, it came through our curse and that he took it fully upon himself. And he, and he alone, could choose to do this. And he's saying, look, Peter, I understand why you brought a sword. But it's wrong because I'm determined to see this through. To be the sacrifice on your behalf. And he doesn't flinch at the task that is before him. So Jesus, at this point in the story, is now taken to Ananias. And it's there then that Jesus says, if what I said is true, why did you strike me? Let's unfold what happened here. It's a, a rather complicated background in history, far too complicated to go into right now, but uh, give you a little bit of it. Because when the, the, the Romans had taken over Jerusalem, they had deposed Ananias, who was the official high priest. And they had set up in his place Caiaphas, and it's a little more complicated than that, but that, that gives you the general idea. And there were sons and there were relatives who, who also were in line and, and had to take turns in, in being the priestly role. And, uh, but the minds and, in the minds and hearts of the people, it was Ananias who was still, so to speak, the Jewish high priest. Caiaphas was the Roman high priest. And when this band comes, this is not a civil arrest. It's primarily the religious authorities. Even though Peter has struck off the ear of a person, he's not taken to civil courts. He's taken to religious courts. So Jesus is taken to Ananias, the high priest, and he's questioned about his teachings. And he tells them, I haven't taught anything in secret. All you need to do Go ask some of the people who heard me teach. I taught at the temple. There was a bunch of them. You can ask any of them, right? If you want to know what I said, go and ask those who heard me. And the issue here is the truth. Jesus spoke the truth. Every word that he uttered was true. And what we have here is the innocent being accused by the authorities. That in a way, even though the authorities were, were, res, were, were responsible for their actions, they were actually fulfilling something even greater than they had realized. John records something that Caiaphas had said. That it was expedient for one man to die for the people. Now Caiaphas meant that in an entirely different sort of way. 
You know, if you, if you get rid of this man, then peace will come into the land. But John sees the very heart of the gospel itself. John sees something greater in the words of Caiaphas, something of far greater significance. John understands that it is expedient for one man to die in place of you and me in a way that we could never even fully comprehend. And indirectly, John's question to us here is, what are we doing with Jesus? What are you doing with Jesus? That's John's question. What are you doing with Jesus? There's this man, and he speaks, and the winds and the waves obey him. What are you going to do with a man like that? These authorities have no idea what to do with him. If I speak the truth, Jesus says, why do you treat me this way? What are you going to do with a sinless man? What are you going to do with a blameless man? What are you going to do with someone who claims to be the Lord of glory? Someone who says, I am. What are you going to do with the word who was with God and is God? What are you going to do with the one who was God from the very beginning? What are you going to do with him? What are you going to do with the one who says, I come in order that they may have life and have it more abundantly? What wrong have I done to you? Jesus is saying. It's interesting that, that John wants us to understand that even in this mayhem, even when somebody strikes Jesus across the face. Did you notice how Jesus stays in full control? Jesus is in control. Now there's a, a third feature of this story that I want us to see. And that comes from the words of verse 27, if you're following along. At that moment, a rooster began to crow. This is the, the third element of the story. It's about Peter. And these are words that, that Jesus had already prophesied about in chapter 13, that, that Peter would deny him three times before the rooster crowed the next morning. If this had happened to a, a young believer, we might be able to understand it, right? But Peter, right? Peter had been a, a disciple of Jesus for three years. He heard all the words that Jesus had said and Jesus had taught and Jesus had preached, words that aren't even recorded in Scripture. He'd sat around the campfire with Jesus. He'd, he'd had breakfast with Jesus. He was there and he, he listened to Jesus preach the Sermon on the Mount. Can, can you even imagine what it would be like to sit on a mountainside and listen to Jesus preaching the Sermon on the Mount? Peter was there. Peter had seen Jesus performed many miracles, healing the sick, the lame, the blind. He sees on one occasion where some people go to the lengths that they, they tear a hole in the roof of the house, right? And they, they lower a friend down into Jesus so that he could be close enough that Jesus might heal him. Peter had seen a uh, dead man dead for three full days. Come out. Lazarus, come out. He'd been taken up to a mountain with two other disciples, including John, and, and there he'd seen things that you and I will, will never see. These were Peter's own words about that experience. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Peter had seen Jesus' glory. When I think about those words, we'd, we were eyewitnesses to, to Jesus' majesty, right? Peter's words. When I think about those words, it makes me think too about the task that John was given, the same John who wrote this book, that John was given to, to, to recount for us uh, what, what, what heaven is like, right? In the book of Revelation. How do you put into words what John saw when God gives him a, a, a brief glimpse into heaven? And it says, John, 
your job is to put that into words that people can understand for all time. How do you do that? Or how about uh, in the Old Testament when they'd enter into the tabernacle and there they would be in, in the presence of the glory of God. How do you explain that, right? And Peter had experienced that. He'd seen Jesus' glory. Yet, after that, seeing Jesus get arrested, what was Peter's response? Hey, hey buddy, aren't you, uh, aren't, you one of, aren't you one of that guy's disciples? That Jesus? Yeah, aren't you one of his disciples? Me? No, uh-uh. Second time, it's a, it's a relative, Malchus, the guy who had his ear cut off. Hey, Peter. I can almost see him like poking his finger in his chest as they're warming their hands by a charcoal fire. Aren't you one of his disciples? Didn't I see you? Didn't I see you in the garden? All three times. No, uh -uh. no, not me, wasn't me. Nah, nah, I don't know that guy. Wasn't, wasn't on his team at all. No, haven't followed him. And then the rooster begins to crow. I imagine in that moment when Peter hears that rooster, he realizes the words that he said. His heart just sinks to the floor. Right then and there, Peter lost his joy and fellowship with the Lord. I don't think he was, I don't think he was cast out. And he, I don't think he ceased to be a child of God. But he lost the experience of the victory of discipleship of following Jesus. Peter had failed. I think Peter thought that his Christian life was over. And in the story, you actually don't hear of Peter again for a while. The next time you see Peter, he's back up in Galilee, right? And what's he doing? He's fishing. All night long, he's been fishing. And he didn't catch a single thing. As though Peter is saying, I I've, I've failed miserably as a disciple. I'm going to go back to doing something I knew how to do. That's something I used to be good at. I'm going to go back to the thing that I know, right? So he goes back and he goes fishing. So he's out in a boat for the whole night, not even a nibble. God doesn't even give him a, a single solitary fish because he's not done yet with teaching Peter a lesson because there's no way to go back. We're only going forward. And I want us to see a couple of things here. Peter fell even though he had been warned beforehand. It's one thing to fall, right? But it's another when you, when you fall, when you've been told beforehand what is going to happen. And not that it's going to happen three years from now, in fact. I mean, if you remember in the story, he tells Peter a short time before it happens, this is going to happen. And then Peter denies him three times, just as he says. I've got a buddy. This was a few years back, a number of years back now. My friend had just gotten a new truck. And it was spring. And there was some flooding around where my buddy lived. Now, this wasn't just any old truck. This was a big truck. It had 33-inch mutters on it. Six-inch lift kit. It had a, a built engine that had been tuned on top of it. It was, it, it was, it was quite the truck. It's a pretty awesome truck. It was one of those trucks that when I pull up to a stoplight and I see one of these trucks pull up behind me, all that I see is like the bottom of the bumper in my rear view mirror because it's so high up. So my buddy decided this fine spring day to take his new truck out for a spin, despite the fact that most of the roads around where he lives were flooded. 
And he said that he made it about five miles down the road and, and that none of the water that he'd gone through, he'd gone through a bunch of water and, you know, he's splashing big truck, having fun, you know, just out for a good old joy ride. And, and uh, none, of the t- none of the water, he said, it had, had even come close to going over the top of his tire. So he's like, oh, we're doing, we're doing great. Until all of a sudden he wasn't doing great. The water that hadn't come up over his tires all of a sudden was up over his hood. And there was a current that was almost strong enough that he began to worry was going to pull him downstream. Apparently, the road had washed out where he was driving. He was very fortunate in that there was a farmer not far behind him who had actually literally seen him drive past and knew that the road was out. So the farmer had already turned his tractor around because he was driving his tractor and started heading in the direction that my buddy was driving. Thankfully, the farmer had a big tractor with a big rope, and they were able to pull the truck out. Nobody was injured, and the truck ended up being okay. But he had been warned, right? Jesus had said to Peter, watch and pray so you don't fall into temptation. Even though he had been warned, Peter still fell. That's the the wickedness of our hearts. That's the measure of our unbelief. I think it's important for us to see how far that even a Christ follower like Peter can fall. Christians aren't exempt from sin. As Christians, we're capable of committing some truly heinous sins. Christians are not perfect. We don't have it all figured out. And sometimes, sometimes we really bomb. I mean, think about it. Noah, he was a drunk. He got drunk. David committed adultery. Peter denies Jesus three different times. And there go I, but for the grace of God. We are all capable of failing, just like Peter. But here's the good news. We, just like Peter, are not abandoned. We're not left to let our sin and let our failures define who we are for all the rest of time. Even, what, even in what I suspect was what Peter would say is probably the biggest screw-up of his entire life. Jesus loved him anyhow. And the good news is that our salvation isn't based on what we do, but on what Jesus has done. If we repent of our sins and we ask Jesus to be the Lord of our lives, then even in the middle of of the mess that we have created. He is there. That is the good news of the gospel. That Jesus loves you. No strings attached. He loves you. I doubt Peter ever forgot that night for as long as he lived. I mean, imagine... Every morning when Peter wakes up and he hears the rooster crow, right, would be a reminder to him of the grace of God, the the love that Jesus had for him, the unrelenting determination of God not to lose any of his own. And I pray that you too would see the mighty grace of Jesus Christ, just like Peter did. And then in repentance that you would know Jesus' love personally. The good news of the gospel is you can't earn it. You don't deserve it. But God has given it to you anyhow. It's called grace. Jesus loves you. That is the good news. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that we can hear these stories and learn from them and begin to 
scratch the surface of understanding of why Jesus came, what he did, and what that means for us. God, in this time, there's so much in the world that has been upended, so much uncertainty, so much fear, so many things that we are out of control of and we just don't know at this point. But despite all of that, God, you are greater than it and you are in control. And that is such a deep and wonderful assurance that your love is never ending, never stopping, that it's unchanging that you have loved us since before there was time and there's nothing we can do to make you stop. So God, we thank you for that love. We thank you that you sent your son Jesus as we prepare ourselves walking our way towards Easter. May we be continually reminded of your great love. And God, even on this day, there may be somebody listening who's just said, yeah, I'm a screw-up. I've failed. I, I proof what Peter did was bad, but what I've done is worse. Hear me now. God loves you too. And the Bible is clear that if we would repent of our sins, if we would turn away from them and turn to Jesus, if we would put our hope and trust in Jesus, that through him and him alone that we may have eternal life that he alone is the solution to our sin problem. If we would put our hope and trust in that and confess our sins to Jesus and ask for forgiveness, then we too can inherit eternal life. We too can be engrafted into the family as children of God. So God, we thank you for that radical love we thank you that you sent us Jesus, that he can take away our sins. We thank you for the freedom that that brings. And God, as we go forth, we don't know what this week may hold, but we know that you hold this week. Our hope and trust is in you. You are greater, and that is good enough. Thank you. We love you and praise you in Jesus' high and holy and beautiful name. Amen. Thanks for stopping in. Thanks for worshiping with us here at Glory Baptist Church. If we can love, if we can serve, if we can pray, if we can do something for you, let us know. We don't know what the world is going to be like a week from today, but we do know that Jesus is greater and that as long as we are here, we're going to do our best to make much of him. Go and serve your king. Amen.